Well, I want Taylor to be aspirational specifically because she's a billionaire. It's like, I feel like the ultra wealthy owe us something. Okay. <laughs> because it's like, and we don't have to get into like the case against billionaires on this podcast, but if you're going to be one of like, you know, a handful of people on this planet that have billions of dollars, then do something with yeah. it that I can't. That's really why I want Taylor to be aspirational. Hello, and welcome to Talking Too Loud with Chris Savage. I'm your host, Chris Savage, and we're joined by our podcast producer, Sylvie Lubau. <laughs> that was very, like, Price is Right. Come on down. Sylvie Lubau, and today we're playing Plinko. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what Plinko is. Price is Right. Price is Right. Woo! If you know what Plinko is, please email ttlpod at wistia.com. If you know what Plinko is, email ttlpod at wistia.com. We'll send you a very special Talking Too Loud hat. Yes. How about that? We will. Okay. That's real, people. So we have a great guest today, Kristen Bryant-Smith, who is the VP of Brand at Help Scout. Help Scout is an all-in-one platform that helps companies manage messages from their customers, partners, and vendors with ease. And Kristen is here today to talk about brand. Brand refreshes. They did a brand refresh. We did a brand refresh. Um, what matters in a brand, how to build aspirational brands. She has some hot takes too. Real hot takes on this one. This one got wild. This one got this one went off the rails in a great way. <laughs> yes. I was like, say more things, you're my new best friend. Yeah, you were just speaking each other's languages. <laughs> she was speaking mine. But it was fun. And, and Kristen also used to work at Wistia, so I know her very well. Worked together on lots of projects. She's an amazing person. So it's been, it was awesome to catch up with her and see her in this context of Help Scout. It's always fun to catch up with people that you have spent lots of time uh, doing enjoyable work with. There you go. But first, Sylvie, what has you talking too loud? What has me talking too loud? Okay. This is like, this is a little ranty. I belong to a gym. And they have treadmills in there that just don't work. And I'm yeah, like, the what the actual F is this? What's the point? Yeah. What is the point? If yeah. I can't get the incline high, I'm trying to do a little incline yeah. jog combo. You're trying to work those hills. I'm trying to work those hills. <laughs> and they're not letting me. They're not letting me reach my full potential. It's really frustrating. I pay good money. That is one of the most frustrating things. It's just like, I, I know the feeling. You go up and there's like, the treadmills are pretty full. And yeah. there's one that's empty. You're like, oh, I'll take that one. Yep. So it kind of looks at you a little bit when you get on it. And then but they it's don't like, say. They don't, oh, they don't say anything. And they then, don't say anything. Then, and then you're trying Sorry. to go and everyone's just in their zone. And then it doesn't work. And then you have to take someone else's. And then it's just. I'm like screaming at the top of my lungs. You know what, though? There was a gentleman there like a week ago who who saw me get on the empty one. He was like, yeah, that one doesn't work. And I was like, mm. I see you. Good looking out. This is like my problem with having like a gym in my home, like in my basement, which is like I never have to wait for anybody. Yeah. And so when I So you go now to, have negative patients. When I go to a normal gym, which I do sometimes and I'm traveling or whatever, I just get... I get like, I get like, like frustrated Hulk? very, no, I just very fast. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be doing these like split sets between these things and this. I'm like, okay, no one's on them. And then I go from one, I go down there and someone's on the thing I was just on. It's like, I mean, it's fair. Of course, no one's on it. They should take it. But like, I, I was using that. I'm like, don't you understand? And it's like, what kind of signal can I leave without <laughs> dominating too much of this stuff? And I get all in my head. It's horrible. I'm and so I just... This is such a funny episode of something. <laughs> <laughs> just you at a hotel gym. Like in this mental anguish because you can't, you're doing split sets. And now there's yeah, and it's a like timed. It's like time. And then it's like, all right, I'm yeah. going to do this for an hour. But if I'm, I, it could take an hour 10, might even take an hour 20. You know, if you're, if you're trading you're off, that, do I, do I have just that after 20 minutes? Just leave the no, gym. Yeah. It's over. It's just, just, it's you over. just huff about or about and just drop you your weights about. and make a lot of noise. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're not huffing about, when you're talking too loud, about something mm -hmm. that you're excited about. What is that thing today? So we just had a hackathon at Wistia. Fun. And we try to do these like two to three times a year. 
just did one. It's kicked off on Monday, and then Wednesday was demos. 17 demos. And I was, like, hosting this hackathon with Brendan, and my jaw was, like, on the ground, like, most of the time. Like, most of the time, I was just like, ugh. Like, I couldn't believe it. And there were so many things Part of the goal this time is we use a system now called Canny that takes all like customer feedback. It gets categorized and there's comments on it and people can vote on it. So it's very clear to see um, how much feedback we're getting in different parts of the product. This is something we'll eventually open up to customers even more directly so that they can be voting and stuff. And every hackathon project was to solve something on the Canny list. Wow, that's very cool. And a lot of times in the past, it's been just do it about whatever, anything. But this time it's this list. And the goal was that all the products could actually launch. And some of them were live in the product by the end of this. And a lot of them will be going live in the coming weeks. But it was just so like, the vibes are so good. And like, it was so exciting to see all this stuff um, and so fun. And I guess what I'm saying is like, if you have the ability to do hackathons, like please make hackathons a regular thing of what you do. Because like the energy that comes out of these things it's just so crazy and awesome. Now, speaking of energy, this interview with Kristen Bryant Smith is off the chain when it comes to energy. <laughs> we had so much fun um, and really excited to get into it with you right now. Kristen, it's so good to see you. It's been way too long. Been um, way too long. Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely happy to be here. So, as you know, uh, when I get excited, I cannot control the volume of my voice. You have some similar tendencies. Sometimes you and I, many times when we work together, would get very pumped up, very excited, get a room going. I will never forget when you joined Wistia and, and it was like you came into BPM of Soapbox and then it was like, hey, also we're having a conference and we need you to represent us uh, <laughs> and this product at the conference. And you just like went in there and jumped in and just like sold that thing. And I like, got everyone fired up on it and everyone excited. So anyway, I'm just really excited to be here talking loud with you. I'm happy to be talking loud with you. And yes, I thought you were going to tell a story about that time I freaked out with Joanne Chang talking about croissants, but I'm glad that it was this story instead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, we can go there also. But <laughs> I love croissants, people. I love croissants. <laughs> well, I have to ask you the question, Kristen, what's got you talking too loud? Okay. So the, to be honest, this is probably going to be a hot take, but recently what I've been talking very loud about is the lack of style that we've been seeing from Taylor Swift. It's award season. And you know, we were, <laughs> there was the Grammys red carpet, <laughs> huge letdown from T Swift. And then, you know, like that just kind of has snowballed into her continuous wearing of like, ratty braids and you know she went to the super bowl and her boyfriend just got a ring and like there's a whole thing but like i've been talking very loud about the fact that if you are a billionaire then you owe the poppers beautiful fashion you know you know mm. if, if you, you like you were here to inspire us not to be relatable because you're a billionaire so that just really has me talking too loud right now and i just i want more from her and uh yeah that's that's probably it Hot take. All right. Well, we'll send her this clip. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, let's the see. Swifties are going to be in my DMs. <laughs> but you know what? To be honest, I am not a Swifty myself. But I have, I have friends that really love Taylor Swift, and for the most part, they all agree with me, which is like, I want something fun and exciting and inspiring when it comes to fashion, especially when you're talking about award shows. Like that's why we watch them because it's like couture, not because you look like you put together a sheet and wrapped a belt around it. You know, so. <laughs> It is what you it want is. her to represent her brand properly is what you want. You want to deliver on the promise of the T Swift brand. But actually this is what people say is the brand. Relatability is the brand, but it's like you're 34. You don't need to relate to 16 year olds by dressing like them. Like give us something. You want to change her brand. I want to change her brand. I want to rebrand Taylor Swift. I want to rebrand her. You want to I'm, elevate. You want to, elevate. I want to, I want yeah, her yeah. to elevate. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I want to elevate her. Brand. <laughs> Well, you are the VP of Brand at Help Scout. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, can you can you tell us a little bit about the company and who it's for, and like how you elevate that brand and how you think about it? Absolutely. So at Help Scout, we sell customer support software to small, medium sized businesses. Um, anybody who really needs a product to help them manage incoming 
email requests from customers can use our platform to communicate and collaborate as a team. As VP of brand at, at a company that serves SMBs, and we are ourselves an SMB, uh, we have about 140 people on our team. And so my marketing team is about 16 people. And so we are, you know, the ones that are getting the work done of running our blog, running our website, uh, doing all customer communications, launching products, like all of these things are done by 16 people. Um, we acquired a company last year, it, which was a wild, fun thing to do. Um, but a lot of the work that I do every day is just making sure that we're telling cohesive brand and product stories, making sure that we are saying things in the market that resonate, that hopefully add value and inspire people to do their work more effectively um, and build community along the way. So uh, a lot of that comes from content marketing. We've had a really strong blog for the you know over a decade at this point in time. And so we've just built a really strong community of people who love providing excellent customer support, love, you know, connecting with customers, understand how when you value customers, you can grow your business. And um, that is what kind of keeps people coming back to a lot of the content that we make at Help Scout. And then I think the second part of it is just like from a web design perspective and how we think about design more holistically at the company. It, you know, we're a very design led company. So from a product design perspective, we care a lot about simplicity. We care a lot about power. We care a lot about the product feeling very effortless. This is a product that if you're on a support team, you're in every single moment of your day, <laughs> which uh, you don't know like how much cognitive load a product can put on you if you're just looking at the same screen for like 90% of your day. Um, and so our team is very conscious of that from a de design perspective. And then when I think about it from a brand design side, we want to make sure that like from the moment that you, you land on the help scout website you understand what you're going to get from our product the experience that we want to create for you holistically so we hope that it's welcoming we hope that it's kind of straightforward and simple but that you understand kind of like what you're going to get from the outset from us can you talk about the interplay between the experience on the site and like the brand values and the look and feel and actually the product itself and how to get that balance right. You know, because the Help Scout brand is, is a very beautiful, very clearly design first brand. How do you make sure you see that basically through the entire experience? Well, this is something we did not do well for a little while. So for those of you who don't know this, we just launched a, a new brand in November. And part of what motivated that is that the brand that we had on our website felt very disconnected from the product. So we would have feedback from folks who thought that it was going to be one thing, but because we didn't really show a lot of product screenshots and there was a lot of illustration, hand-drawn kind of illustration on our website, that once they got into the product, they were confused because it was a clear disconnect for them. Um, and so one of the things that we really considered as we updated our brand was creating more of that cohesion between the buying experience and the actual user experience of the product. And so part of that is done, I think, with color. We try to be intentional about using the same colors inside and outside of the product. We use the same um, type typeface even now. We have like a shared repository of, of things that we didn't use to use. Um, and then a lot of it is just collaboration, I think, between product design and brand design. A lot of times those are two totally different teams and they are two different teams. They have two different directors at Help Scout. But I think that in doing so, if those two people aren't talking at a company, a lot of times those visions can get very disparate very quickly. And so, um, I, great, I had confetti oh. in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing that has me talking too loud is these damn reactions. Like, who asked for this, Apple? Who asked for this? Nobody wanted balloons. Nobody wanted balloons, okay? Like, it's just ridiculous. Oh, boy, I have to turn these shots off. Oh, my God. Anyway, what do you that mean? was ridiculous. Oh, you. it's a rainy day. <laughs> wow. I turned it off. I turned it off, I think. We'll see. Anyway. But yes, your head of product design and your head of brand design, if they're not the same person, they've got to be talking to each other. They've got to have like similar perspectives of where to drive, you know, where they want to grow. And um, there's so many moments inside of the product that are also kind of brand touch points and how our brand yeah. team can influence them. Or is, that's another part of cohesion and like just being very intentional about that as well. It's interesting. We did a brand refresh ourselves today. <laughs> it just went live. Oh, yes, and, I've seen. Uh, did you see it? Yeah. Yes. It's funny. I got funny feedback on it because someone, someone who I've known for a while texted me and was like, 
it's very exciting to know that I knew Wistia through its pointy corners to now your rounded corners. Like you've really done it. Cause like, uh, you know, we had pointy corners everywhere on the player on the side. Now it's all rounded. Um, and we changed the, the type mark of the logo and a lot of other things, but I can echo what you're saying, which is like getting the connection strong across product design and marketing design, like to get that done properly it took like, I mean, it took a lot of work and it took a lot of systems, right? Yes. Like getting the systems in place so that people can very quickly make a decision and hopefully still move really fast, but actually move fast in the same direction, um, which I found to be hard, honestly. And like, and I, I'm interested to hear in your case, in our case, we ended up rebuilding a lot of the infrastructure of the website too, yes. to do the rebrand. So we took that up. Once we start going in there, like, oh, we're going to change the logo. We're going to change the colors. We're going to change these other feels of the brand. Then it also was like, well, for doing all this change, let's actually audit the site. Let's clean it up and let's improve it. And so the project got bigger and bigger. Oh my gosh. And, you yes. know, the impact should hopefully ultimately be bigger too. But is that the same thing that happened with you all? We had this thought that we were going to redo the brand in October of 22 or so. We started the work of okay. say we wanted to start with uh, revisiting our brand values and our company values. We wanted to rewrite them to be more succinct and more aligned and that we were going to kind of do yeah. some work on just like the foundation of the brand updating. And then by June of last year, we started into the site work of like, how did we update the site? At the time, we thought we okay. were going to update 12 pages. We had a scope of 12 pages <laughs> yeah, we were going to yeah, update yeah. on the site. It was like our core <laughs> yeah. product feature pages, the home page, the pricing page. That's what we were going to do. And everything else could just kind of like shift over from like a colors perspective and just kind of get like a global mm -hmm. restyle to carry it. We shipped 42 pages. <laughs> like we like basically quadrupled the amount of pages that we were going to do because it's like a slippery slope. Once you get in there and you see like, it's actually easier to use the new system than to restyle something in the old system. And it's like, if you're going to put any energy towards something, why would you put it towards half doing it? So uh, we definitely fell into the same scope creep when it came to it. And I honestly, like that's a benefit of doing it in house is like, your scope can creep a little bit <laughs> compared yeah, to like, yeah. if we had just signed up for 12 pages, we would have just kind of been stuck unless we wanted to pay a ton more or we wanted to uh, extend the timeline, you know, with a, with a company. So I don't know the actual number of pages that we changed, but it's very high. And I, I, I'm afraid to say the number out loud. Um, it is interesting though, cause it got me thinking you all refreshed your brand and saw that opportunity. We saw it and for us, it was like, uh, hey, this is also, a, this is like a beacon out. Like if you come back to the site, it's a beacon out that actually a lot has changed at Wistia. There's more products, much more like functionality, much more power. Um, and it was like our visual cue of like, from this day forward, if you come to the site and you hadn't been in there in a while, you're like, there's something going on here. Yes. And it, I don't know if that was something similar for you all, but it's like, it's, because I want to be clear for folks, like sometimes when you think about a brand refresh or you think about the colors, it's easy to think, well, like, does it matter? And it's like, actually, I believe it matters a lot, a lot which is like, it's, it's all adding up to this different experience. And it's like a signal to folks of like, hey, you should take another look. Something has changed here. And ideally, it's like you're changing in the right direction. We strove for like elevating the brand slightly, simplifying the architecture of the ideas behind mm -hmm. what we're presenting. But is that is that how you felt too? Like I'm just wondering because it's just it's such funny timing that like you and I had this call scheduled and then it turned out that it was like literally on the day I love that it. we changed it. It's well, crazy. Well, for us, we also had made dramatic changes to our product. So we have a yeah. new like within the product, we have a new inbox experience. So the this the place where people manage all of the customer conversations that are coming in, we gave a huge facelift to. And so that product design work was years in the making. And that like yeah. in and of itself um, was a lot of work just in terms of simplifying systems, the back end, what it's built on to enable faster product development was actually the guiding light there. And then product design kind of overlaid yeah. that and said, well, let's simplify the whole interface. So when we thought about using in our new brand identity, really using a lot of product screenshots, we already were like, well, we have to do this justice because all of the product screenshots we can use now are absolutely gorgeous compared to what we would have had to use before. Um, and so there is definitely something new to, to see within Help Scout. But I think the other thing for us is that 
and I'm curious to hear about for you at Wisty is like we're up against a lot of enterprise level players when people are coming to buy our software. And so when you're looking at kind of like what we consider mid market, which I know bigger companies wouldn't consider mid market, but think about companies that have like 50 to 200 employees. They're still evaluating somebody like a Zendesk, right? They're evaluating big enterprise software that actually might not be a fit mm. for them now, but like it's easy to go with the incumbent. You're not going to ever get like fired for purchasing Zendesk, right? But so when you're comparing us apples to apples and Zendesk and our brand kind of felt more juvenile, more like downplayed, overly earnest is a way that I used to describe it is like, yeah, it's harder you for you, totally. <laughs> you know, right? Like, it's harder to think yeah, compare overly that. Overly earnest is like that nails it. Zendesk, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like I. It's it, so that to me was like what I really wanted people to leave with is like this is not Zendesk. I'm not trying to like tie us to Zendesk too closely. But if you are someone who's going to figure out like, should I be trialing Zendesk? Should I also be trialing Health Scout at the same time? That you don't automatically make assumptions about if there will be misses based on your brand perception. That you from the start are like, oh, well, this is pretty modern software with a sleek UI and a pretty strong brand and lots of great resources. So this feels like a very established company as well we should. We've been around for 13 years. We're just focused on different customers that Zendesk is and like they should go win all of the enterprise business. We don't want that business. But for small and medium sized businesses, like you don't need to pay for that. You should be, you know, in a cohort of things that will really grow with you and that you're not going to outgrow for many, many years. Yeah, I think it's just really interesting to think about the like brand as a beacon. The brand is a symbol to like to attract the right people and turn the right people away. And that's what you're, you're saying here is like, you know, the company strategy evolved and the product evolved. And so then it made sense, of course, that the brand also had to evolve. And I think that's very natural, makes a lot of sense. But I think when you're like a startup, sometimes it feels like when I say startup, I'm really talking like less than 20 people. You could change something in the product and you could also really quickly change your website and some other things. And so the, the lag time is like a lot less, right? Like it's like, totally. oh, like we launched this new feature. Oh, now we're totally different what we do. And now I changed my website. Now everyone understands. But then if you've been posting on a blog for 10 years and you have thousands and thousands of customers and you know you have all this other infrastructure in place, it's allowed you to scale to that point, it is actually a pretty big decision to change the brand because you know you're not signing up for like a weekend worth of work. You know, you're signing up for you're signing up for a lot of work that can feel soft, I think, when you when you hear about it, until you get into the details, you're like, it's not soft at all. It's like tons and tons of concrete, hard things that should have a real impact in terms of like how people perceive you in the market, right? Well and Chris, it's what you said where you, you can't be everything to everybody. And I think that that's where a lot of brands get lost, where they don't really have a perspective. And now I like to call it SaaS in a box. We looked at so many SaaS websites. <laughs> and I'm telling you, they follow a lot of the same things. There's like trendy stuff. Yeah all across these websites. And that's okay because it's like maybe, you know, on the one side, if you're a click rate optimizer, then you're like trying to all do the same things. You're putting buttons in the exact same place for people because you're trying to make sure that you get the clicks because it gives people comfort to navigate all these websites in the same way. I understand that fundamentally. However, I feel like what it creates is just these copycat SaaS brands where everybody's website looks exactly the same and follows the exact same path. Yeah, they don't stand out. And then it's just like, you just yeah. get lost in that whole sea, you know? And it's like, what that means is if you choose to have a perspective, you're going to rub some people the wrong way. Some people aren't going to be able to find everything. We use some copy that is like not direct copy. It's, I hope it's not confusing, but are there some people that won't get the idioms or are there some people that will be like yeah. still like a little curious after reading a page that has creative copy versus if I had just used very direct copy? Absolutely. But we have to be comfortable with that um, because we think that yeah. it's, it's still a brand like in risk. our voice. It's worth it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's funny because like I, I've been thinking about this a lot and, and talking about it because we've certainly made this mistake over the years at Wistia, which is like you see another brand do something. You're like, oh, it must be working for them, so I should do it. 
And I feel like your SaaS in a box thing is like, that's what's happening, right? It's like, well, this is what a SaaS pricing page looks like. And this is what a SaaS homepage looks like. And I know people are trying to cut corners to get something out faster. And I respect that. I think that's a good thing. But you never know if you're copying something that's working. That's, that's no. the thing you don't know. And you, and, and, Absolutely. You, and you also don't know, like, if you're copying something that makes any sense for your strategy. But if, and it's okay if you're younger, it's okay if you're like a yes. less mature SaaS company to copy stuff because I feel like it can help you kind of punch above your weight class, right? Where it's like, yeah, you, you don't faster. have a full design yeah. team. So you're like pulling yeah. insights from like totally. established brands. But when you're like an established mature company and you got a whole, t you're paying a team of people to be your designers. That's a big investment to just create something that anybody could have done. Yeah, and I think it's also just like to copy something and assuming it's going to work and actually your strategy is slightly different and it therefore might have the opposite impact. Like you're basically saying a big part of the rebrand is like, all right, let's elevate and get to where we think we should be today because our product has gotten so much better. Let's make sure we send the right signal to the market that if you were a mid-sized business, which is like center of the bullseye for you all, and somebody is going to like consider also Zendesk, make sure that it like it's on the same level in terms of like actually consider us versus look at us like, oh, they're so earnest and sweet, but like, I don't think that's for me. Okay. Um, but someone else could copy you today who actually is much smaller. They don't know where they're going to end up with their strategy and they're going to look more enterprisey or like more available to that class of customer. They might turn off the very startups that would try them in the first place, but they don't even realize. And I think that that's happens. Right so much and it's like it's such a painful mistake because to your point like you are still building stuff yes. you're still designing things <laughs> and and so it's just like it's it's when you for me it's like when you can get it to be a core part of what your strategy actually is mm -hmm. if you're taking a risk and it's actually core to how you get to market and and the way you want to be different and all those things then go wild. And if things fit within that, great. But like, it's such a classic mistake that people make. I've made the mistake a bunch and it's just a waste. It sucks. Well, and Chris, I think the other part of it is that as you build your own brand voice, like it takes time and people want to find some shortcuts. Like it's a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of alignment and who you get buy-in from matters because you have to have that perspective very clear from like your leadership team and you don't necessarily have to you don't have to have the alignment for whether or not that's your brand from your customers and i think that's hard for people who want to like listen to customer feedback and shape things because i think if we listen to some of our customers it, it i'm not sure i mean we haven't seen it in the numbers it's not like we've seen churn since we rebranded but it's like you know, I'm sure there's some people that are like, oh, man, I miss yeah. that. I, I miss the illustrations or like, yeah. oh, man, like they seem yeah. a little bit more corporate. Like, I, I'm sure that that earnest nature of our old brand really was resonating for some people. What we hope to do was like hold on to the good pieces, the authenticity, the like human elements of our brand, the casual nature of our tone, even as we elevated it so that it really felt like we we brought people along i talked to the company about this last may where it just feels like uh when you're a teenager which we are as a company where you're like trying to figure out who you should stay friends with and you're you're not exactly the same person but you know who you are like inner child is always mm -hmm. with you throughout with the rest you. of your yes. life yes. you know <laughs> but it's like yeah. but you gotta yeah. try some different looks you know, you got to try a different vibe style wise, maybe, or you got to try a new hobby that you, you might be really good at, but you, you, that didn't fit your like preppy style before, whatever it might be. It's like businesses go through that too. And it's like, you're still core, you know, the core of who you are, that like depth of your identity should persist and people should still see you for you. It's just like a more elevated version of you. Did you all consider changing the name of the company? No, not once. Okay. I don't even think we asked the question like I we never like never even asked the question that the logo was on the table from the start, but it was a quick, quick cycle on let's tweak the logo. I don't even know if most people notice what we changed. I feel like, logo. yeah, if you change the name that I, I don't know, that would be that'd be crazy. Well, it's just a it's a very I mean, it's a very extreme thing to do. I was just wondering. um because I think that like never are on the table. I know people who have done it 
and I know people who have regretted it and I know people who have done it and it was like the greatest thing that they did. It's, mm. it's an interesting one. Cause you're basically saying like, it's a, it's not a refresh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big reset at that point, right? Like yes. you're going full reset. So there must've been something like really wrong or just like, you know, you were so anchored on one type of customer or one, even maybe one product that like you changed because you needed people, you need to create a new space in people's brains that they would like slot you into. You it's know, like Facebook versus think... Meta, right? Like when they, like when they did well, that change, even... yes. when they went to Meta, they're trying to tell you that there's what they do is no longer just social networking. It is like also like this, like tech and headsets and all this other stuff. But they didn't change the product name of Facebook. Yes. When totally. they did that, they changed the company name. They created an umbrella company just like Alphabet did, right? But like, yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, if Bud Light can make it through 2022 and still call themselves Bud Light, <laughs> after all the drama that they went through, after all the sales that they lost, I mean, like, this is like hot topic, hot button, losing market share, yeah. to Modelo, and they're still called Bud Light. Yeah. Like, it's going to come back. Like, they just, you have to believe in the equity of your brand at that point in time. And so, like, to me... For Help Scout, you know, I would say 90% of our revenue comes in organic direct. So that means people are searching for things that are up on helpscout.com, blog traffic that we yeah. get, we garner. Like we would lose significant amount of search equity by changing our name from Help Scout. And it, I just don't, yeah. and to what end? <laughs> to like, to name yourself something that then you have oh, to rebuild it, brand yeah. equity for? <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying you should do it. I just think it's, I just think it's an interesting. Have you ever thought about renaming Wistia? Like, did you have, like in the last 15 years? I can remember it came up once in one meeting once. <laughs> and then it was quickly to your point. I was like, this is, that's pretty dumb because like we've built up so much brand equity. We're just be flushing it down the toilet basically. And like one of the differentiators for us, like you all is like, we've been around for a long time and we've had this like staying power and we've been investing in the brand for so long that to throw that away felt like crazy. So we quickly moved beyond it to other ways to signal the change. Chris, that just made me think about that picture of you and, and Brennan in suits when you were like 25. Yeah. And you thought that that was like how businesses were run. It was like yeah. in suits. And I think it's so true when yeah. it comes to brand is where it's like people think that a brand is supposed to be one way if it's going to be successful and it keeps it holds them back from what is true to what their customers actually want and the differentiators that they can offer the market. And so I feel like if you're thinking about renaming your company, you have to be in search of brand equity to make that change, I think. Yeah, um, I think that's right. You know, like it, it has to be that something is t terribly off. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just. No, can't. you're right. I think the way you put it is really great. Like you have to be in search of the brand equity versus yeah. habit. I think once you get it, like, and that's, and that's a good point too, for anybody that's starting a business, like think long and hard about that name. Cause you're going to be stuck with it. Well, it's like if, if Wistia was named like video company or like something, <laughs> Or like video hosting or whatever. That then it's just like That you, just you know, rolls could, off the tongue. Well, sometimes people name things like exactly what they do. Yes. You can imagine the website and the domain that is describes exactly what it is that you do and someone can go to it, they search for it accidentally and find it. That thing is almost always just like a point solution that can't it's so hard to evolve beyond mm -hmm. it. And that's where I have seen name changes happen where someone does something hyper specific. They have a, the first name is like they're not thinking about brand at all. And then mm -hmm. like they start realizing, oh, I need a brand because I need people to know what to expect, like to expect whatever it is I do and expect it across my different products. Um, I also want to go back to like aspirational brands. And I, you said something really interesting talking about Taylor Swift. She's in this position where you want her to be aspirational. You want her to be on this different level. Can you just talk about that feeling and like what that means and how people because it's all tied in together. I think when anyone's trying to define their own brand or picking the products that they, that they want to work with, like talk about aspiration. Like, what do you look for? Why, why do you want her to be aspirational? Well, I want Taylor to be aspirational specifically because she's a billionaire. It's like, I feel like okay. the ultra wealthy owe us something. <laughs> because okay. it's like, if you're going to be 
you're gonna if you if and we don't have to get into like the case against billionaires on this podcast but if you're gonna be one of like you know a handful of people on this planet that have billions of dollars then do something with yeah. it that i can't because like that that's really why i want okay. taylor to be aspirational so like rihanna she's doing something with her billions of dollars you know like she's wearing things mm-hmm. she's making makeup products i can't make she's supporting her husband as he's on trial <laughs> like there's just like a lot of things rihanna's doing <laughs> that like i can't do with my because i don't have billions of dollars you know like she's <laughs> at LVMH parties, like, great, 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 great. Oprah, right? Like, she's funding the color purple. She's, yeah. like, funding movies. Like, she's doing... Taylor is yeah. just making music, right? She's making music. It's making her a ton of money. She's going yeah. on tour. She's inspiring people, like, with her music. But what I need is just more because she's a billionaire. You like the fact that, like, you see someone who is, like, uber wealthy. is like, show me all the shit I can't do. Like, and like, well, what's the bring point me in not? on it or like, because if you're not going to okay, do okay, any of okay, that okay. other shit and you're just going to like hold your money in a fucking bank somewhere, that could be feeding children. Like, that's fucking stupid. Spend the money, put it in the market and shut up about it. Like, or feed people, like actually just feed people, fix the government's problems. Okay. Like, show me the money. <laughs> Sorry, I went Jerry Maguire on us here. But anyway, no, you, got talk- you, did, you did, you know. <laughs> what, what got you talking to us? Uh, <laughs> billionaires. I think we found it. <laughs> billionaires have me talking too loud. Like, it's so stupid. Nobody should make that much money. But if you do, give me something for it. When it comes to aspirational brands, specifically, like, I think with software, there's like this cool limitation around like the fact that people use software to get jobs done and like your work self is using our software. I mean, y'all have like this, you know, with whiskey, yeah. I feel like you might have some like solo creators that get value out of your product and freelancers and that sort of thing. But for us, it's like the value is really only there if you're on a team um, because it helps simplify so many processes with communication when yeah. you're on a team. Um And so like your work self only wants to be inspired in so many ways, right? Like my software is not going to help you be a better parent. It's not going to like fix your, your home life in any way. (laughs) Like it's just going to make you better at your job. And so I feel like for an aspirational software brand, it's like make the most out of the time that people have to give you in their like working life. You know, how do you make sure that you're not just, making work worse because nobody wants to be at work anyway. Like back to the billionaire thing. It's like nobody actually wants to participate in this. Like we all would rather just sit at home and talk to people all day, like and not have to worry about money. (laughs) (laughs) Like I would rather not have money. The hottest take. The hottest take. Like capitalism sucks. (laughs) I just don't want to be (laughs) working, but I am. But here we are. Kristen, 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 Kristen. <laughs> Reel it in. I'm just saying, nobody wants to work. Do you really want to work? Oh my God. This- I love work, but I'm. I'm no, 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 I'm no, no, the- no, no. You love making things, Chris. You love making things. You love talking to people. You And the, yeah, the fact all, of the but matter my is. Work is all those things. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. But I'm just saying, like, even if there was no money involved, you would find ways to build things and to talk to people every single day, because that's what brings you joy. Like, and I'm just saying that, like, money, if we remove money from all of it, if we, like, <laughs> the reality of it is, like, we would not work. We would just do things we were good at, you know? <sighs> Wow, you and Sylvie need your own side podcast, I think. Seriously, you're topic. speaking my language. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. The anti-capitalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but, but at the end of the day, and I'm saying this from like a very capitalist perspective, right? Which is like, but at the end of the day, a lot of people are at work. And those people who are at work are using our software. But we have to, that like puts an onus on us as providers of B2B software to say like, how do we make this time better for you? Because I know you could have been with your kid instead. Like, I know that like, you're just, you're working to pay your bills for the most part, you know? So it's like, how do we make that just better for you? And I think that that's like a really powerful position to be in as a software company. And so to be aspirational is to like, feel that weight that you have the like responsibility to improve somebody's working life who like probably doesn't want to be at work. So I I don't know. Yeah, no, I think, I think that you're, I like your answer. I think it's interesting because like 
what I what I heard in there that I really agree with uh, because I like capitalism, but I, it, <laughs> is uh, is um, the idea of like the people like when I had a kid, it was just like suddenly I had this other alternative thing I want to spend my time on. And 100%. I, when meetings ran over, I was like, what the heck? You're wasting my time. Or if we start late, I hated that. Or like if it wasn't well run, it, it, it changed my perspective a lot on work. And and I do think that we miss this opportunity that you're talking about in B2B all the time, which is like, if I can save you time at work or I can enable you to do something you couldn't do otherwise, or like take the work off your plate that sucks. So you have more of the time to do the better work, or it just means you get your work done less time. You have more time with your family. That's actually a huge win. And it's very connected to how people live their lives every day. And I think that like, you know, there's people who don't think that like brand matters in B2B. And I feel like they're, they're missing is this, which is like, yes. they're missing this very, it's like all these people who are at work, like they have lives. And so it, of, course it matters. of course it matters a ton. They have lives, they have lives. Um, and they care more about, and most people care more about their life than they do about work. Yes, But for sure. when they're at work, how can we make that better? And I think like, you yeah. know, for us, we build software that is primarily used by customer support people, people who unfortunately are often judged by like as a cost center, right? And they're like very productivity yeah. output oriented measures for a lot of support teams. And at the end of the day, it's like, if you have to get through a certain number of questions, answer a certain number of questions throughout your day, before you can log off or before you can like not feel like something is hanging over your head, how can I make it easier for you to answer your customers? You know, like that's what is really driving the product forward, like making it easier for you to solve problems so that you can get on with your life and leave work, you know, yep. like, yeah, totally. But Savage, Love I'm going to win you over on this, like uh, one day I'm, I'm <laughs> going to, because like at the end of the day, like we are not made to work. We are made to soak up the sun and to be barefoot with our children on God's green earth. You know, like that is, that is really what we are made for as humans, you know, to create. Well, to create, I will, I will align with you on that. I think, I think we are, I, well, I just think like everyone is wired to want different things and like, I like building things. And so I like making things and yes, I agree with you. I would do it, find some way to do it in some other way. And if it happens to be work, then it's for me, it's like, well, my work doesn't feel like work. It feels like play. Right. And so that's like the, that's like the joy for me. And I know I'm lucky and it's rare that that is the case. So I agree with you on all of those pieces. And uh, yeah, I've, I miss you, Kristen. You know, I miss these oh, conversations. stop it. <laughs> but you know what, Savage? Um, I, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I was talking to somebody about this the other day where it was like, we are in the system and I am I am one to operate within the system that is ahead of us. You know, I'm not trying to, I'm not actually trying to dismantle capitalism. Like this is, I, I'm here. But <laughs> At the end of the day, what that requires of us is to say, like, I go to work to get paid. How can I get paid? Like, how can I be my most productive work self so that I can, like, work the system, too? Like, you you got to feel empowered to work the system. And it comes back to, like, the tools that you use, right? It, it's like your team. It's the tools. Like, do your best job is the way you get through it, you know? And I think it's the culture, right? Isn't it? It's like yes. also, like, it's like voting with your feet. It's like picking yes. companies that, like, give you the other things that you want in your life or the work-life balance or the type of work or um, how decisions are made or how transparent it is. Like, I think about that a lot. It's like, you need to vote with your feet. Like that's the, that's the good side of capitalism. Really. You don't like a job, you can go get one somewhere else. Like we have yes. historic low unemployment. Now tech has been hurt recently more than a lot of other industries, but still totally. there's a lot of companies that are hiring and trying to figure it out. And I think you have to think of yourself as like an agent of change looking for those things. Um, Kristen, we could just keep going, but we have a rapid fire segment and we got to get to the rapid fire. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Fast answers. Are you ready? No, go. <laughs> Who is your biggest brand crush at the moment? Ramp. Ramp. Okay. That's they had like this buzz code did this like sick brand thing for them. The photography, all of it. Ramp. Yeah. They're doing great. We had their head of product on recently, Jeff Charles, great guy. Great episode. Right. Um, if you could trade places with anyone for a day, who would it be and why? Blue Ivy, because Beyonce would be my mom. And then Blue Ivy would be you. <laughs> hmm. I bet she could do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> poor, my poor husband, my, my son for a day. My team would be fine. <laughs> okay. 
Um, name something you're low-key good at outside of work. I'm a great cook. I'm mm. yeah. I yeah, I'm a great cook. I love I love decompressing in the kitchen after work. So uh yeah, I'm I'm good at cooking. I'm also good at awesome. crossword puzzles. I'm mm. really good at what like, else are you good at, Kristen? I, I'm good at, <laughs> what am I not good at is an easier question. I'm a little pitchy <laughs> when it comes to singing, but I think that's my only flaw. <laughs> Well, that gets me to my next best question, trait which is what's your my humility. <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's your go to karaoke song? Oh man, I don't know. I pick so many. I like "Dreams" by Fleetwood Mac. Done better as a duet, though. Mm. But I I love that one. Um, I will survive. Glory Gaynor. Mm. You know, classic. I, yeah. yeah, I got to just stick oh, with the seventies yeah. vibes most of the time with karaoke. Okay. Date, marry, kill with social media platforms. TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. Date, marry, kill. Kill TikTok. I've never had a TikTok. Well, it's too old. It's too late. <laughs> I guess I'd date YouTube and marry Instagram. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Kristen, it was so it was so good to hang out and like catch up again. It's been way too long. Where can people connect with you? Where should they follow you to learn more? LinkedIn. That's my most used social media platform these days. So... Yeah, find me on LinkedIn. I'm Kristen Bryant Smith. Amazing. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. So I just love how at the end of this interview, basically, we stop recording and then Kristen's like, but come on, do you really like work? Like, do you really love it? And we get, and I just want people to know that this conversation that we just had is like very real and very much was like ready to just continue. And yeah, this was not a bit. This no is bit. all bitless. Bitless. <laughs> Bitless. That was a very interesting conversation on all fronts. I mean, mm -hmm. the way that Kristen like really broke down the brand refresh was so interesting to me and how, you know, you were echoing this, like you, do, it, it sounds soft. Like even the word like refresh, it's just like, it sounds yeah. kind of puny or like, I don't know. But when you really think about the implications, when you really think about all the things that need to change, it's a huge lift. It's a huge lift. And man, oh man, it's, it is, it is cool that you guys that help scout and Wistia kind of had this synergy of refreshing around the same time. And it's not a thing you can do all the time. Like if you're constantly, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it you all shouldn't. the time. Yeah, but if you're constantly, constantly refreshing our brand, unless that's your shtick, it's it is not a not a thing you're going to want to do like you want like familiar colors and identity and you know logos and things so that people can recognize it in the wild it's a very important part of a brand so it is like not something you constantly want to do but it is some something that you sometimes need to do and i do think it's interesting that it's like these moments when it's you need to send that bat signal up. You know, you need to tell people like, hey, something changed. And this is a visual indication and maybe like a color indication or even like copy indication that something very new is afoot. I don't know. It's We have never done something on this scale before. We've updated and of course, like evolved the brand over the years. We've never done it holistically, a change on this scale. And um getting it right like it can have a really big impact and it can actually help you get way more value out of all the other work you've done uh, but it is this like really interesting balance like how do you how do you set the right signal mm -hmm. i thought the teenager analogy was also really interesting and like thinking about you know when you're a younger person a younger company you know you are kind of copying you're trying to figure out what works for you but then once you hit that adolescent phase you're like, what do I stand for? Who am I? And like, you choose a perspective. And I don't know, there was something very humanizing about that, that I was like, oh, of course, like that makes sense in a company framework too. Yeah, it was cool. And I mean, it's also just like to see Kristen doing all this and like, you know, you can see her, she's really unafraid to like bring out her hot takes. And I think that's actually just really, really important because if you can't do that and understand maybe like how your brand fits into the cult, your customer's culture, 
it is hard to figure out where to go or when you actually should change something or not. And so I think she's had really great instincts um, in getting them through this change. And I remember her having those same instincts when she worked at Wistia. And it's just cool. It's cool to see her in this place and navigating through that change. Like it's, it makes me, makes me proud. Such a dad. You're such, such a, a dad. dad. I'm such a loser. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I can't believe I said that all That wasn't. <laughs> oh, hey, boy. I thought it was a sweet moment. <laughs> yeah. It was okay. like, oh, sorry. I care so much about people. <laughs> Wait. I didn't mean that as a, as a negative. Is that how it felt? I don't know. Oh, my God. <laughs> I thought it was genuinely nice. I wasn't poking fun. <laughs> I, I, yeah. You misread my tone or my face. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. To do it again, or I don't know what to do. <laughs> I like said something totally earnest, like, "Oh, you're a dad." Not like <laughs> you're such a dad. Like if I had said it like that. We've gone off the rails. Is all this in? Is this what the know. people come for? Let's I think try it's it. probably in. Let's I think try it's it. In. Yeah. We're gonna try mm -hmm. it. This is us. Great. Well, um, if you're still with us, thanks for thanks for sticking around. Uh, what are they supposed to email to get this hat? What are they supposed to email? TTLpod at Wistia.com. But uh, what are they supposed to give us a take? What are oh they yeah, supposed to tell do? us they have to tell us what Plinko is. Yes. You have to tell us what Plinko is. Don't look it up, though. Don't look it up. Okay. We want you to You have to know it in tank. your heart, in your what bones. What do you think this is? Um, and uh, you can, of course, rate and review the show wherever you listen to it or watch it. That's super helpful. Helps get the word out there. Um, or you can find Sylvia and I both on LinkedIn. And until next time, we'll see you soon. Keep talking loud. <laughs>